Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Therefore, let us stand and sing and praise His name with hymn number 88, Maker in Whom We Live. Not that one. Maker in whom we live. Just, just a minute, Greg. Greg, Greg, hold on a minute. We're looking for hymn number eighty-eight, Michael. If you got it. Ah, oh, is that right? Yes. Hymn number. All right. All right, Greg. Go ahead. <laughs> Maker in whom we live, in whom we are and move, the glory, power, and praise receive for thy creating love. Let all the angel throng give thanks to God on high, while earth repeats a joyful song and echoes to the sky. Deity, let all the ransom raise, render in thanks their lives to thee for thy redeeming grace. <coughs> the early choirs proclaim and cry salvation to our God, salvation to the Lamb. Spirit of holiness, let all thy saints adore thy sacred energy and bless thine art renewing power. No angels' tongues can tell thy love's ecstatic heart, the glorious joy unspeakable. Saints, thy love hath made thine everlasting praise. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to worship here at Sweeney First United Methodist Church, where we are so blessed indeed to worship a God who is perfect, even in an imperfect world, and who is happy to love and to be worshipped by imperfect people. And that is what we are. But our God is so, so good. He is so, so great. And He has done so, so much for us. He has brought us together. He has brought us here. And all the works that He has done in this church and in our lives, the Scriptures say that greater works than these still await us. That we trust, that we hope, that we believe. And so this gives us confidence, as the Scriptures say, to go to God in prayer. That if it is in the spirit of holiness, whatever we ask for, God would give it to us. So I invite you to be bold this morning. And I invite you to be vulnerable this morning. Make your needs known to God and he will fill them. Joys and concerns, make them known now. Yes. Prayers for Jean. Continued prayers both for Kathy and for John. Yes, Karen. The Stewart family, the Stewart family, right? uh, they all pray for you. Mm. Prayers for the Stewart family. Prayers for Nicole. Prayers for Trudy and for your whole family. In Jesus' name, Johnny. Uh, 
Prayers for Cheryl. And yes, Jackson. Well, prayers for your grandma, Jackson. Granny. Other prayer requests this morning, joys or concerns? Are there those from those joining us online? Prayers for Dennis Moody. Prayers for Dennis, indeed. Are there any others this morning? Then let's take these to God confidently in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning daring to approach you because you are already with us. And indeed, you bring us closer and closer to you with each passing moment. This is your promise, that you would have sent us the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with us, to guide us, to teach us, to grant us forgiveness of sins and assurance of your love and faithfulness. So we believe, God. In Jesus' name, we believe. And we lift up those who need you now. For Parker. For Jean. For Kathy. For John. For Nicole. For Cheryl. For Dennis. For Jackson's granny. For the Stewart family and for Trudy, and for her whole family. Lord, we know that you love these people, whom we also love, and we know that you love them even more than we do, or that we could know or comprehend. Do not abandon them, Lord, nor do uh, let them linger in this grief, or in this pain, or the suffering that troubles them. But God, let your peace, which surpasses all understanding, be in all of our hearts and minds. And let your grace with all healing and delivering power be in abundance in these people's midst. That you would bring them forth into greater and greater life. The life of your son, Jesus Christ. Our hope, our model, our salvation. It's in his name alone that we hope and that we pray. Amen. Let us stand again as you are able for our next hymn, number 496, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer That calls me from a world of care And bids me at my Father's throne Make all my wants and wishes known In seasons of distress and grief My soul has often found relief And oft escaped the tempter's snare By thy return, sweet hour of prayer Sweet Sweet hour of prayer The joys I feel, the bliss I share of those <coughs> with strong desires for thy return with such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows <coughs> Sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to them whose truth and faithfulness leads <coughs> and since. Cast on him my every care, and 
wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. And I'd invite our youngest saints to come forward for the children's moment. I get y'all with that every week, right? You try to be seated for a moment and then pop right. It's fine. You're young. You can do it. We are going to first say, indeed, the Apostles' Creed. Because sometimes I get the children and then other times I get myself. So, friends, if you would rise as you are able, we will uh, confirm our faith. In, with the church in heaven and all over earth, with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now you may be seated indeed. Well, we have been talking about the Ten Commandments, so what we have today is, uh, which commandments are we on now? The Eleventh. Wait a second. What is it, Jackson? Commandments protect us from um, bad things that can happen. I kid you not, that is what I have planned for this children's moment. Wow. Okay, so... <laughs> There were ten commandments, right? And we we went over all ten commandments, and I said that I might pop quiz you guys. I'm not actually going to do that today. Stay tuned, though, because I might sometime in the future. And the question is, well, why does God give us these commandments? To stay safe. safe. Right, exactly. But what what does the commandment against killing someone have to do with you staying safe, Brandon? Or what does not lying to someone have to do with you staying safe, Jackson? Absolutely. That is all very true. So even those commandments that are about things we're not supposed to do to other people, those are supposed to be so that we don't hurt other people. But at the same time, when we hurt other people, we end up hurting ourselves too. There's, there's no way around that. It's like Harry Potter with the Horcruxes, right? Anyone? Bueller? Yeah? I was really counting on you guys to know that reference. Well, <laughs> But lying to someone, not only does that hurt that person, that hurts us, and it hurts that relationship. Hurting someone else, whether it's just hitting them or, or going all the way, that doesn't just hurt that other person, that hurts us too, and it hurts that relationship. God has all these rules that get talked about throughout the Bible, and not just the Ten Commandments, but other rules as well. And God doesn't give us those rules just because that's how it goes, and don't ask any questions about it, but because it's good for us. It helps us to live the best lives that we can, all of us. And that's why God gives us rules and commandments. Jackson, where's your pterodactyl? I was going to make a joke about your pterodactyl. He was going to go eat the T-Rex. That's quite the pterodactyl. Well, all right, let's ring the bell, guys. (laughs) Amen. 
Amen. As our youngest saints return to their seats, friends, I invite you to close your eyes, bow your heads as we take a moment of prayer. Lord God, we are grateful to come now to this moment where we can hear your word read. Lord, we ask that as we do hear your word, that it would not merely be words from thousands of years ago, but it would be fresh, that it would be compelling, that you would make them living words, not only to hear in the ears, but to be etched in our hearts. And help us to open ourselves, Lord, to whatever your Holy Spirit would have to do with these words in our lives today and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The word of the Lord comes to us today both from the gospel according to John and the epistle of 1 John. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. And what uh, we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him just as he is. And all who have this hope purify themselves, just as he is pure. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The old saying goes that ignorance is bliss. And I'm convinced that there is no more blissful ignorance than the sweetness and the ignorance and the blissfulness of childhood. But you know, as an only child, I grew up basically around other adults. There weren't other kids my age for which to learn what it was like to be a kid from. I grew up around adults because I was an only child. And my parents had church people over all the time. So here I was, a a little kid, you know, just about Jackson's age. And there were all these adults, much bigger and much more allowed to do whatever they wanted to do than I was. You see, there were so many things that kids aren't allowed to do. Because rules and commandments are meant to keep kids safe and learning and growing well. Now, adults have different freedoms, but when you're a kid, when I'm an only child, and all I see is that contrast well, it seemed to me to be a grave injustice. All these other human beings that are just as human as I am are allowed to do all of these things that I am not allowed to do. Where is the fairness in that? Well... This was justified to me in that I would be allowed to stay up late and to eat what I wanted and so on and so forth when I was older. So I had to wait. I had to wait to grow up. And now don't get me wrong, I loved all the things that are good about being a kid, right? There's the freedom, the lack of responsibility, and there's the play, and there's all the friends and the experiences. Things are new. The world is new and wonderful. Those things are great. And I wanted to grow up so I could have all of the other things, thinking that I get to keep all of those other things about being a kid, too, forever. Right? Well. All those other good stuff, the stuff that the adults got to do, I just couldn't wait to get those things so that I could have it all. The freedom of being a kid and the freedom of being an adult. Ignorance meets bliss. Living, as it turns out, requires growing. Growing, as it turns out, requires maturing. And that requires a give and a take. One that you can only learn, really, as you experience it. Now, as a wizened 27-year-old who's seen many winters in the adult world, I am uh, not getting as many laughs from that one. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> 
We spent a lot of time the past couple of weeks talking about grace. And John Wesley and the Methodists have typically characterized grace in three ways. Provenient grace justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Now, the Bible says that we are saved by grace. So what Methodists mean, what we take that to mean, is that we are saved by the whole spectrum of grace. We are saved by provenient grace, and by justifying grace, and by sanctifying grace. Now, we spent the last two weeks talking, respectively, about justifying grace and about provenient grace, but... If we stop there, we're missing a big piece of this thing called salvation. If we stop there, we're actually doing ourselves a pretty massive disservice. And in fact, if we stop there, if we stop short of sanctification, we are throwing out most of the scriptures. Because 1 Thessalonians says this, This is the will of God, your sanctification. And what is sanctification? I believe that the scriptures, the vast majority of them, show us that sanctifying grace, that third piece of the whole spectrum of grace, is nothing less than the grace of life itself. I mean, truly, when you get down to it, this whole Christian business is about life. It's about living. God created us in love, like we talked about in week one, and God saves us in love, as John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, therefore... He sent Jesus to save us. And that's why he saves us, right? Because he loves us, yes. But when you save someone's life, you save their life in order that they may keep living. You save them in order that they may live, and that is what God does for us. God saves us in order that we may live. That's what salvation is all about. And that goes especially, I believe, for sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the grace of life. And as the scripture proclaims, not just any life, but the true life, the resurrected life, newness of life, the very life of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean that in some poetic way either, mind you, although it does sound poetic, and there are some nice metaphors that we can use and that I will use momentarily for this, but I mean this in a very real way. The grace of life, sanctification, given to us by the Holy Spirit, has very real impact and very real consequences for us. In our first reading from the Gospel according to John, Jesus is talking to the Pharisee Nicodemus, who is poking these questions at Jesus. And Jesus says to him that in order to be saved, you must be born again. He says that of everyone, in fact, that in order to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born, quote, by water and the Spirit. And Nicodemus uh, plays a little coy. He's being a little cheeky with Jesus. How can someone who is old be born again? Physically, he asks. How can someone who is old be born again? But Jesus doesn't say you must be born again physically. He says you must be born again by water and the Spirit. And what that means, friends, is our very deaths and our very resurrections. This is what Jesus did. He died And he descended to the dead, and then he rose again to newness of life, to eternal life, to life in the Spirit. And our journey, our incorporation into this story, it begins with the Holy Spirit, and it ends with the Holy Spirit leading us down that very same path. For in our baptism, we die descending beneath the waters, and then we rise again out of them to new life, to life in the Spirit of God. It's really fitting then that when Jesus comes along, he starts calling God Father. So, you know, the Israelites didn't do that before Jesus showed up. They didn't call God Father. They, could, they couldn't really say God's name, right? That's where we get Yahweh from. Or when God says to Moses, I am who I am. And they had other names for God the Lord, Elohim, or Adonai, and so on and so forth. And Jesus comes, and he calls God Father. And he encourages his disciples to do the same thing. Because God created all of us, Israel, uh, Israelite or Gentile, young and old, 
you know, what, a male, female, you know, born in the eastern half of the world, the western half of the world. God created all of us. And in that sense, God is our creator. But God recreates us. God gives birth to us anew. That's why we call God Father. He creates us and he recreates us. And that's what it means to be born again, what Jesus is trying to say to Nicodemus. We are to die to sin, to the old life to the devil, to the world, and we rise again to the new life, to the true life, to the eternal life, life in the Spirit of God. Thus the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith, in the Son of God. Friends, God saves us so that we may live. He saves us so that we can live. It sounds so simple, but it's so important. God saves us so that we can live the true and full and eternal life. That's the life He always meant for us before sin got into us. That's the life that He desires for us now, even in the midst of this fallen world. God saves us so that we can live. God doesn't save us to condemn us. God doesn't save us to shame us. God doesn't save us to scold us or rebuke us like we were uh, you know, troublesome children, but God saves us so that we may live the full and true eternal life, the life that is found only in Jesus Christ. Now bear with me for a moment as I relate this Metaphor back to the whole spectrum of grace once more. In this sense, provenient grace is God preparing us for this new birth. In that same sense, justifying grace is God giving birth to us anew. Justification, the moment in which we are born again. Excuse me. And that means here then that sanctifying grace that big missing piece so far, is God helping us actually live and walk and move and grow into the new and full and eternal life. And that means some very important things for us. Now, Amy and I don't have kids yet, so I don't have the experience of raising a human being like many of you all do, but I think I can make some inferences about that experience. There seems to be few things more joyful than a new birth, a new life, the moment that it comes into the world, whether you're a parent or a grandparent. New life, a new person, a whole new being coming into the world. And then there's the added joy, I guess, I assume, hearing the stories after the sleepless nights. But there's the joy of watching them learn and grow. And the first time they laugh, and their first word, and then learning to walk. There's so much joy in those early years. But, also inferring here, that there's a point where you start expecting that infant to really stay, take some steps forward in their maturation, in their growth. Not just in age, right? You do expect them to get older, but you also expect them to really, truly grow. Because as joyful as those early years can be, Newborns aren't supposed to stay newborns forever, right? They're supposed to grow in age and in maturity. And I imagine that's a bittersweet thing, right? The last time that you pick your baby up again because, well, you're not going to be picking them up anymore. Or when they grow up and leave for college, leave the nest, so to say, and they're out of the house. Trust me, I'm an only child, so I've experienced through my parents some of those bittersweet feelings. And ultimately, though, I'm guessing that all you parents and grandparents here want your little ones to grow and to reach maturity. I mean, the alternative is them living with you and off of you forever until you're retired and gone, and I'm guessing that that's not exactly the ideal situation for y'all. Yeah. Children are meant to grow and to mature so that, and that's the goal here, right? That they may be independent enough and wise enough and experienced enough to live a good and full life. Hopefully a life even better than the one you have lived and are leading. That is the ultimate goal of every parent. My friends, 
It's the same with our heavenly parent, our heavenly father. And it is the same for his children. God, our father, both created us and gives birth to us anew. But we aren't meant to stop there. If we do stop there, then we are doing ourselves a massive disservice. If we do stop there, then we are throwing out most of the scriptures. But first John says this, see what love the father has given us that we should be called children of God. And like children, we are meant to grow. Like children, we are meant to mature. It's great to be in that joyful state of infancy when you're new and life is new and things are easy and comfortable, but we must go beyond spiritual infancy. We must grow in the sanctifying grace of God. And what that truly means, what it means to grow in grace, is nothing less than to become more and more like Jesus Christ. For we are children of God, but we are only children of God by virtue of the spirit of adoption that we have been given by God's firstborn and only Son, Jesus. And in Him, in Jesus, is all the maturity of the Spirit. In Jesus is all the grace of the Father. In Jesus is all the fullness of the true and eternal life. And that is God's will for us. To live that life. Which is to say to be sanctified, that we would live and grow and mature into the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. As First John says, all who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. Back in in the Gospel, according to John, Nicodemus asks uh, tongue-in-cheek, perhaps poking fun at Jesus, how can someone who has grown old be born again. Jesus sidesteps his question and simply reassures him, you must be born of water and the Spirit in order to become a child of God. Friends, I I truly believe that it doesn't matter how old we get in these physical bodies. And it doesn't matter how many years we've spent as a Christian or how many Bible verses we've memorized. All of that is great, but God's will for us, however old we are and however long we have been a Christian, is to continue growing and maturing in grace. And that sounds good to say, but I think in some ways we resist this often, right? Because we resist because we get caught on the great stumbling block of being comfortable. Children learn quickly to be comfortable, right, in their mother's wombs and then in their homes as babies. Mom and dad and whatever siblings and eventually easy meals like perhaps dinosaur chicken nuggets or that was a favorite of mine or routines and patterns and these things while we're young they're so familiar and in their familiarity they're comfortable and in their familiarity they're safe. And that's ideal, right? We're supposed to be comfortable and happy and safe for a time for a season, but the child cannot stay safely and comfortably in the nest forever. That child has to learn even some hard lessons, even the hard way sometimes. That child must take chances, take risks, and have new experiences, even difficult experiences, even if they get burned sometimes. It's through those ways and more that we learn that we do grow, that we do mature, and it is the same way with us, friends, as children of God. Justification, forgiveness of sins, leaning on that forgiveness, leaning on the assurance of our justification, those are easy, safe, comfortable things for us. We need them, of course, right? Just like the infant needs milk until it's ready for solid food. But the infant must eventually become ready for solid food. The baby can't keep on living off of only mother's milk forever. It must go to solid food. It must grow and begin to walk and then to run and to talk and to learn and to ask questions and to work things out on their own. And that is sanctification. Sanctification means standing on the confidence of our salvation by faith. It means standing on the confidence of justification and the forgiveness of sins. And then, from that solid ground, moving down, 
deeper into the kingdom of God, reaching further and further into the life of the Holy Spirit. And that means restoration, and that means healing, and that means purity, and that means justice, and that means righteousness. And it means living the true and full and eternal life of Jesus Christ. It means being forgiven of all guilt, and it also means weaning yourself off of those things which incur guilt. It means casting off those things which once caused shame, and it means also putting off those actions and behaviors and things which do incur shame. And it means laughing. It means playing. It means community. It means joy and fellowship and so, so much more. That is sanctification and that is to grow in grace. And remember, all of that, that is salvation. Because we are saved in order to live. Because that restoration and that joy and that healing and that purity and that justice and that fellowship and that community and that maturation that is living that is living the very life of Jesus Christ when trying to describe this all a little more succinctly this uh, this salvation is all this wide growing spectrum of things Methodists have long had this saying I am saved I am being saved, and I will be saved, all at the same time. So it's less asking the question, have I been saved, or are you saved, and it's more relying on that commitment, that promise from God that we are saved, and we are being saved, and we will be saved, because salvation is not just something that happens to us once upon a time long ago. Nor is salvation some momentary transaction, some moment of epiphany when we finally believe in Jesus Christ. Nor is salvation some far-off dream that we will only be able to attain in heaven. Salvation is now. Salvation is present. Salvation is here. Though we are being saved. And we are already saved and we will be saved, which is to mean that we have been saved, and so we will live. And we are being saved, and so we will live. And we will be saved continually until the day that Jesus Christ returns. And then, most completely, we will live. Now, since we are so saved like this, the Holy Spirit compels us now to live and to grow. The Holy Spirit compels you now, this morning, to live and to grow. And won't you? Won't you live? Won't you grow? Won't you let the Spirit of God guide your hand to reach deeper and deeper into holiness and justice and purity and righteousness? Won't you let the Holy Spirit instill in your mind greater and greater peace and greater and greater joy and greater and greater faith? Won't you let the Spirit of God move in you and through you and lead you to places that might be new and uncomfortable and scary but is good, even if hard, and is from God? And I could go on, right? And we will go on, friends. We will go on today and we will go on forever, more and more into the grace of God, more and more into the life of Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God. Our salvation, our life, our sanctification. But today, today, won't you take the first step? Even if it's a small one. Even if it's a hard one, won't you take the first step down that journey into greater grace, into greater sanctification? Won't you commit in your hearts and minds today not to linger where you are comfortable, nor to remain apathetic where you are safe, but to walk boldly and humbly with our God in newness of life, today and forevermore. For this
what that step is for you today. Whatever your next step into greater grace, whatever your next step into greater sanctification is, that's between you and God. But what I can tell you is this. If you desire to take that step, then step forward here to this table. Here we learn. Here we grow. In whatever way that the Spirit has for you, come this morning and taste and see the grace of our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing to give thanks to you, Father, creator of heaven and earth. In love, you created us. In love, you have saved us. And in love, you send your Holy Spirit continually to save us again and again so that we might be your beloved and you be our loving Father. And so, God, with this confidence and with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which Jesus magnified his love for us, he took bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And he took also the cup, and he gave that too to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, in remembrance of these, your mighty saving acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit in abundance on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we may be to the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ does return to finish his saving work. Now, as we do prepare to share this holy feast, my brothers and sisters, let us as beloved children of God pray this prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are assisting with communion now to come forward.
I'll invite the ushers now to pass around the offering plates. And friends, I invite you now to give joyfully and freely in the grace of God. In the midst of my confusion In the time of desperate need When I am thinking not too clearly A gentle voice does intercede Slow Take time to be holy. Take 
time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be time. In joy and in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, <coughs> take time in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his Spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Our birthdays to note this week are Renee Cother, Chris Van Avery, and Karen Hannah. Are the others to note? Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Good birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Uh, our anniversary to note that I see here is Tim and Anna Pettigrew. Are there others to note this morning? anniversaries. Then we do have several announcements to talk about this morning. Uh, chicken spaghetti tickets are available in the front office. If you do plan to sell tickets, please come by the office to pick them up. We are asking for more volunteers to come and help us sell tickets at this point. Uh, just prior to uh, chicken spaghetti, our Halloween maze is scheduled to be held on Saturday, October 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. across the street in the FLC. Uh, we are asking again for candy donations and for volunteers, especially for booths with the maze. Please get with Bridget if you are available to help. We had such a great crowd last year, and we think we might could even top it this year. Uh, all right, so we've had two town halls recently, uh, one speaker on behalf of the GMC, one speaker on behalf of the UMC. Thank you guys for those who came out for coming to those or for watching them online. I do ask that if you manage to watch one or attend one but not the other, that you would go back and watch the other one that you did not watch or attend. Being a faithful part, a participant of the discernment process means that kind of due diligence. On that note, uh, Columbia UMC uh, came and was a part of those town halls, and they are also having some similar town halls coming up that they have invited us to. Uh, Reverend Kip Giltz, the assistant to the bishop in the Texas Annual Conference of the UMC, will be speaking on behalf of the UMC at Columbia on October 13th. That's this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, a week later, on October 20th, uh, Reverend Rob Renfro will be coming to uh, Columbia to give a speech on behalf of the GMC. That will be uh, the second Thursday from now, October 20th, at Columbia UMC at 6 p.m. Uh, we are going to have one more town hall um, here, and that'll just be kind of an in-house town hall where a number of our Board of Stewards members are going to give their reports on the uh, logistics that are relevant to disaffiliation. I know that sounds thrilling. 
right? But friends, there are a number of financial, legal, and other logistical aspects to disaffiliation that you need to know about before you cast your vote. And I mean that, and I want as many people here or watching online as possible on Tuesday, October 18th. That's about 10 days from now here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Finally, on the process of the vote. The Board of Stewards is ultimately uh, responsible for deciding whether or not we do have the big vote. Uh, the Board of Stewards has not made that decision yet, nor will they make that decision until October 23rd. Um, if the Board of Stewards decides to proceed with a vote, then that vote will be held on November 6th at 6 p.m. That's a Sunday, November 6th at 6 p.m. You have to be a member on the rolls of the church to cast a vote, and you have to be physically present at the time of the vote to cast a vote. Do be here, friends. If we go forward with a vote, do be here. Are there any other announcements to make this morning? Bridget. Other announcements? Last call for announcements this morning. Yes, Sue Ellen. Replacement Wednesday. Mm. So, y'all pray for me. Yeah. <laughs> My, much like earlier in the year, great prayers for John and greater prayers for Sue Ellen. This was asked for. I'm, this is not my words. All right, let's be clear about that too. But... And this following week, the next Sunday, we're going to have a guest pianist because Greg is going to be in the outlying areas of Colorado. I, he's taking a vacation, so. Might need a guest preacher, too, because that sounds pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's all. Last call for announcements this morning. I did see one littler hand up back there a couple of times. People are shaking their heads. All right, then I invite our church family and our acolytes to rise and prepare for our benediction. <laughs>